Welcome back to Cardinalities.org. Today we're going to be continuing with The Skeptic and the Shrink, our series looking at the psychologist's case for skepticism. In this video, we're going to be doing The Illusion of Control. As with all of these videos, I'm not going to be looking at in depth the experiments that give arguments for these cognitive biases being present, but rather I'm going to take kind of the scientific realist perspective and say that these cognitive biases are in fact the case, that they do in fact exist, and then look at the philosophical implications of those cognitive biases existing, basically doing an indirect skepticism move on the scientific realist of saying, let's assume your position and demonstrate that your position leads to your position being negated. So let's take a look. Imagine you're watching a game of volleyball. Whenever you turn your hat around backwards, your team scores. You test this theory by turning your hat forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards, and it seems that when your hat is on forwards, the other team scores. But when your team scores, that means that your hat is turned around backwards. Your team, in fact, ends up winning the game. From this, you conclude that you can affect the game by the direction that your hat is turned. Now, it should be clear that this is an example of the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy, a type of false cause fallacy. For more information on that fallacy and other false cause fallacies, check out my video in Fallacy February, a whole month of various fallacies. Now, however, studies have shown that people are likely to overestimate the amount of influence they have on events especially if those events turn out favorably. If things turn out well, people generally think that they caused it, whereas if things turn out poorly, people underestimate the amount of influence they had on a particular event. So imagine a person is given a slot machine and a switch. Then imagine that they play the slot machine for a while and to are told that the switch may or may not affect whether they win. If they're asked afterward whether the switch had an effect on the game, the illusion of control claims that they will be more likely to say that the switch had an effect if they won more. The switch actually having an effect does nothing to do with their answer. It doesn't actually influence their ability to tell whether or not the switch had an effect. But rather, the amount that they win makes them more likely to say the switch had an effect. Whereas, if they win less, they're less likely to say the switch had an effect. Furthermore, the more comfort that a person thinks they, or control that, that a person thinks they have over a situation, the more assured they are of a positive outcome, or the more comfortable they are in a situation. The less control that they have over a situation, the more pessimistic the outlook. Driving a car, for example, makes you much more sure that you will not get in an accident than if you were sitting in the passenger seat even if the accident is not something you could control for in either position. Now, imagine a science experiment. Between your control group and your test group, you control for every possible variable you can think of, except the one that you want to test. When there are different results in the two groups, you conclude that the difference was caused by the variable that you changed. Now, this may seem like a standard experiment and that you're justified in your conclusion, but there's a problem. The illusion of control makes you think that you had a greater influence on the results so long as you achieve your expected result. If, for example, you had not achieved the expected result, you might have concluded that, well, perhaps there was a variable that we didn't control for. But if you did achieve the expected result, your conclusion is more likely to be, well, what I changed was the thing that had an effect, not that there was some variable that we didn't think to control for or couldn't control for that affected the test. It's quite possible that some variable that you did not think of controlling for or were unable to control for actually made the change, but the illusion of control makes you think that it was you. Now, this isn't to say that all scientific experiments are flawed because you will always think that you are the one affecting it when you're never the one affecting it. Quite often, probably, the variable change may be what actually changes or makes the difference. The problem is that you are overestimating the influence that your change had and underestimating the possibility that 
something else changed it when the experiment turns out in your favor, and you do vice versa when it turns out against your hypothesis. The point, to be clear, is not that you were always incorrect, that you were the one that made the change. The point is that you overestimate your own influence on the change. You may think that your own experiments do not fall prey, of course, to such problems, because you would never be affected by such an illusion, because you maybe are aware of the illusion, because you follow the scientific method very rigorously. However, this is the very problem of optimism bias, which we're going to cover in the next video. The idea that you think that you are excluded from all of these problems that we often talk about, when in fact you, assuming that you are a human and assuming the scientific realist position that these psychological claims are things that actually affect people in the world, then you are just as likely to be affected by this and any other of these cognitive biases that we're presenting here. However, science is not the only discipline which can fall prey to this illusion. Religion can as well. Imagine a man with lung cancer. He tries every possible treatment, goes to every doctor, and nothing seems to work. Finally, he walks into a church and prays to God that he might be cured. The next day, the size of his tumors are down, and he seems to be on the path of recovery. He concludes that God answered his prayers and shrugged his tumors. As with the scientist, the illusion of control tells us that the man is likely to overestimate the power of his own actions when something good happens, i.e. he went and prayed something good happened, so clearly it was his prayer that caused him to get better, and underestimate the power of his own actions when something bad happened, so when his tumors shrank, he was sure that whatever he did caused it, and he becomes a devout believer. But when they did not, he took no responsibility. The argument is then not that this shows that he was not cured by God, but rather that he is not justified in believing that he was cured by God. Remember that knowledge requires true justified belief, so it might be the case that he in fact was cured by God and he believes that fact, but it seems that he's not necessarily justified in that because he would have believed in anything that would have given him that positive effect, anything that he did that would give him a positive effect. He believed that he did something for it, so it happened. He overestimates his own power over the situation. If he hadn't done anything and God had just decided to cure him, he wouldn't have had that same belief. So it seems to me that he's not justified in the same way in his belief, because he's more likely to overestimate his own influence on the actions. Okay? The critique of religious belief can even be taken a step further with a Durkheim-esque explanation of prayer. For more information on Durkheim and Trigg and that whole debate, check out my series from quite a while ago called The Twelve Days of Philosophy. I think the video is called Durkheim and the Sky Cake. People are more comfortable when they feel they are in control. In situations like having a disease where you have little or no control, you want to feel as if you have control. Therefore, the belief that you can affect the world through prayer is really comforting. As with Durkheim's argument, this is going to be insufficient to prove that prayer does not work at all, but rather it's a good way to explain why prayer feels good, even if it does nothing. So like I said, it's not a counter-argument towards the power of prayer, but rather an explanation of positive effects of prayer, even if prayer has no supernatural power in some. Overall, the illusion of control makes you think you have control when in fact you do not. It is a reason to be skeptical of how much influence you actually have on the world around you. That was the illusion of control. Next up, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about optimism bias, the idea that you are kind of excluded from all of these bad things, or it's much less likely that these bad things would happen to you than to someone else. Then we'll talk about the Dunning-Kruger effect. Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.